Hey, all right, Milton, thank you so much for spending uh, some time with us. Please, can you start by introducing yourself? Okay, thanks a lot, Sylvie, for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Babajidu Milton Macaulay. I'm from Lagos State, Nigeria. And um, so let me just give you a bit of myself. I'm an educational consultant and an academic. So I'm a lecturer in a federal university in Nigeria. Uh, so let me give you a bit of short history about how I got into teaching and as well um, consulting. So for teaching, I graduated um, from undergrad in 2010. I attended the Federal University of Technology, Akure, somewhere in southwest Nigeria. And I finished in 2010. I was fortunate to graduate with a first class. And afterwards, in 2012, I was retained by my alma mater to become a graduate assistant, which I took. And then in September of the same year, I was fortunate to win two scholarships. So I won the London Metropolitan University Scholarship. I also won the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship. And so the London Metropolitan Postgraduate Scholarship was for a master's degree in um, biomedical science. And the one to Commonwealth Shared was in sustainable environmental management. And that was to take me to the University of Greenwich. So I went with the, la with the latter because um, it covered everything. So it covered my, my living expenses, my flight fees, even the visa fee, fee, fees, everything. It covered everything, literally everything. Uh, and so I went with the Commonwealth instead of the London Met Scholarship. In, and that was in 2012. And so I ended up in London uh, to have my master's degree. And in 2013, I graduated with a distinction and returned to Nigeria, where I was promoted to the position of assistant lecturer in my uh, school, where I was retained as a lecturer. And then I was there for about two years till 2015 before I won my PhD scholarship. And this time around, it was a Commonwealth PhD scholarship again. Uh, but the nomination this time was now you can be nominated in two ways for phd it's either you're nominated by the, mini the ministry of education of your country or if you're an academic staff you're nominated by a recognized school in your country so i was fortunate that my school was one of those schools on their list so i was nominated by my school as an academic staff for staff development and i was eventually selected by the commonwealth so I got that for my PhD. I went to University of Manchester for my PhD in 2015. Uh, my PhD was in environmental geochemistry and geomicrobiology. I graduated in 2019, June, and I returned to Nigeria uh, to my school as well, where I am right now. And so that's the journey around my academic growth. And I was promoted to a full-fledged lecturer. So yes, I'm in there and I specialize in environmental toxicology and pollution management. Now, so that's my academic career. So on the sides, I run this educational consulting platform called Illumania. Now, in 2012, when I won my first international scholarship, I started helping out people, you know, people will write you and tell you, please, how did you do it? How did you do that? And so I've been helping a lot of people from 2012 to 2016. 18 that's six years and i've been doing this for free i just do it whenever i have the time and i never kept a record of the number of people i was helping but a lot of people were winning but it wasn't even i didn't care <laughs> i didn't keep stock i didn't take notes but in 2018 i had to change everything i realized i needed structure now the reason i needed structure was because i discovered that if i wanted something sustainable then I'll need to bring in a team. I'll need to pay for their time. So I'll need to charge people for that time, charge people for the job done. Then this can even go on without me. And so in 2018, I created Illumania. And then we started taking note of the numbers. Although I started taking note of the numbers in 2017. And so I kept on from 2018, 19, 20, 21. And so Illumina was established in 2018, and the focus was to provide academic support to students, graduates, and business professionals. So the kind of support we provide, dissertation, coursework review, CV restructuring, personal statement review, scholarship application guidance, even data analysis, career counseling, 
research and business proposal writing you know we cover about nine services so if you go onto our platform you'll see everything that we do i had to also bring on board a lot of people so we're 37 in number and um so it's a big team and the beautiful thing is we have no physical office so it's online everyone can work online the payment is done with your card on our website so you don't less stress we're in 2021 it should be less stress <laughs> and um but let me give you a record of um the scholarships that we've been able to help people to win in the last four years since i've been keeping track of the numbers so in 2017 there were 12 scholars in 18 we produced 23 in 2019 we produced 25 and in 2020 last year we produced 34. now this year we produced five already and this is just the end of the second month of this year so in total since i've been keeping track 99 so far so we've been doing so well now people think of us as a scholarship consulting platform but we do way more than that it's just that everyone wants to win the scholarship so that's the popular thing everyone knows that we do but we do far more than that um so that's the consulting part of me and yeah i hope i've been able to summarize it doesn't look like a summary though <laughs> but that's it about me yeah 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 and i think uh it's important that you you say that and you establish that because sometimes when uh people are thinking about who should i take advice from it's a sense of is there a track record here like can we can we look at your starts to be able to know if should we listen to you or not so i think those are important because it helps to establish first credibility and then secondly why should someone listen to you so that 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 work like those statistics it goes ahead of you and people will be okay to listen to you which is a good way to segue to my next question because um you've been doing this for for a while now and um you've worked with with uh, lots of students what are some of the common mistakes that you have seen that students make uh, in their in their scholarship application? And from your experience, what can you give us advice that how they can fix these mistakes that they make? Okay, good question. Um, so there are seven of them that I have on my list. The first is not accessing information correctly. Now, a number of them, probably not all, but most of them, I would say. They do not access information correctly um sometimes they are very lazy about getting information they prefer someone who would just come on board explain how to get the scholarship just explain it to me don't stress me if you if you share a link and you tell them click on this link and read it up it will be like you're stressing me just explain it to me say it to me what should i do and so I feel like if you always constantly want people to tell you what to do, they are going to dilute the information and you will not get the correct information. And so you will not have access to the correct information. It's best you go to the scholarship website yourself. Now, there is no harm in going to someone for the, for the someone to explain to you that there is a scholarship and it's about this this and that and this is the link to get it that's fine but the onus is on you to then go to that website yourself yeah. and check everything out yourself in fact take um, a scholarship notes or diary and even write out the important or key points that you found on that site so that you don't necessarily have to always go back to the, to the site for everything you need now you have a note that you can go back to and then you can work with that and only go to the site when you need to but people are so lazy and they always look out for advice from others so that's one mistake i think they'll make and so how do you correct that learn to always go to the site yourself so that you don't get confused so that when someone says come on well shared it's only one course you can only do one course you can only pick one course then you can say no i came across i went to the site it says i can do multiple however i can only pick one if when i win so you you tell the person that no you're getting it wrong i read it the interpretation is wrong you can actually try multiple courses but when you win you can only choose one yeah. so that but you won't be able to argue if you've not been on that site you won't be able to know what the truth is if you've not been on that site so that's one mistake another is 
applying for the wrong scholarship. Now, this is very common. Um, people just apply across board. This scholarship is out, I will apply. That one is out, I will apply. That one is out, I will apply. <laughs> I think people should be more strategic. Uh, you need to be more strategic. Um, you don't need to apply for everything. I used to be that guy, but that was when I did not have sense. <laughs> and that was when I did not have direction. That was when I didn't have a mentor. And I lost a lot of such. I lost a lot of such scholarships because I was not strategic. Now, so what should you do? When you hear of a scholarship, first and first, visit the website, read up on the eligibility criteria. If you know you're not a perfect fit for that scholarship, you're not the kind of person they want, then there is no point trying. Leave it alone and focus your energy on the scholarship that is the best fit for you. Let me cite a good example. Shevlin scholarship would say two years work experience before you apply. Someone has six months and is asking me, I still try. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is so weird. Like, <laughs> how can you try? It says two years and you're still asking me if you can try. Hell no. Don't try. It's not for you. Come on, well shared is a better alternative because those guys don't care about your work experience. They don't yeah. care. So, that's a, so uh, understand the scholarship that is meant for you. That is a perfect fit for your profile. That's another thing. Yeah. Now, another one is... Um, Choosing the wrong referee. <laughs> mm. <laughs> now, people do not think that choosing a referee is an issue. Like, they always consider it the very least thing to do. Yeah. A referee, I'll just pick anyone, anybody. Oh my good God, I need to tell you, reference letters are graded. They are taken seriously. They read off the reference letter. Like, they, they grade it. it, it has a score. Don't um, treat it so um, lackadaisically, like it doesn't just matter. It matters, and I'll explain why. It matters because um, now anyone can say anything of themselves on their CV or on their per personal statement, on their personal statements. But what will make the scholarship sponsor believe you is if you have a respectable someone write a reference for you mirroring the same thing you've said about yourself on the letter saying yes i can attest to the fact that this guy was the best in his class yeah. this guy finished among the top two percent in his class this guy actually finished on the course that i took as the best in his class this guy actually published a paper on so 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 he is so good i can attest to his intelligence his work ethics this guy is the best guy for this job. If I I have no reservation, you, you know, about his capability to succeed on postgraduates. If I had the chance, I will pick him myself. You know, if I had the opportunity to take him as a student, you know, and they look at one, his credibility, he's not likely to lie. Mm. And so when they match that with what you've written about yourself, then they believe you. Yeah. So take this seriously yeah. your referee is so important it's part of winning <laughs> it's it's part of you winning this the scholarship yeah. i remember my referees for masters and phd they wrote me fantastic reference letters fantastic and i'm sure it counted towards my winning the scholarship that i've won yeah. so choose the right referee yeah. one they have to have the qualifications. They have to know about writing reference letters. Some do not have a clue how to write it. So they write th three lines and they give you. <laughs> Please, you need to choose the right people. Now, for masters, it is not compulsory that your referee has to be uh, your, your previous research tutor or your supervisor. Okay. It's not compulsory, but it's compulsory that you have someone who has taught you before yeah. so that the person can attest to your academic uh, competence. Yeah. Now, the other person could be someone from your workplace who can attest to your work ethics. Now, someone from your workplace can attest to your academic competence and you're going for an academic pursuit. So you need someone to balance it. You need someone from your institution. So that makes sense. But for PhD, it is important to put your master supervisor. 
So if it's for PhD, it is important to put your master's supervisor. For master's, it's not compulsory. You put your bachelor's supervisor. You need to realize that. I just need to chip that in. Um, one more thing is obtaining the academic documents late. That's another uh, common mistake. They obtain the academic documents late. Now, you know you want to delve into um, the pursuit of scholarships, but then you do not have the necessary where we are. You do not have your certificate. You do not have your transcript. You don't even have your international path. How will anyone let you on the plane? <laughs> are you going to grab onto the, the, the tires and be like, oh, take me to the UK. Take me to the UK. I don't know how you want to get on the plane without yeah. an international passport that means you're not ready yeah. like you're not ready yeah. so some of you are not ready and that's why you do not get i hear people say my transcript kept me that's your fault now they blame it on the institution yeah. now while i will not um um cover for the institution some of their lapses and their unnecessary bureaucratic processes yeah, yeah i will not co cover yes true I know it's there you should know they exist and you should have started earlier and so i i i expect that your document should have been obtained at least six months a year before the scholarship is out i agree that's two years before departure so this is so key the sixth one i like to talk about Oh, sorry, that's the fifth one. Now, the fifth one I'd like to talk about is not paying attention to details or not following the instructions. This is a common one as well. A very good example. We had a client who came to us, er Erasmus. Now, she was applying for Erasmus. And so she applied, did everything, brought her draft to us. We reviewed everything. We sent it back to her. She submitted. Two weeks after, she just told us that she's been disqualified. I said, what? Disqualified? Why? And then she said, because they said her English language certificate was not, um, what's the word now, was not suitable for admission. Oh. I said, is it expired? Her IELTS result, is it expired? She said, no. Then I said, then check why she said she doesn't know why i said that's not true for them to have told you it's your english language certificate and you submitted your ielts there is something wrong with the document so is it expired she said no then what exactly is the issue eventually we found out that there was an instruction on the website of that program that says that the minimum score you should have on a band should be 23. Now, there are four bands, reading, writing, listening, and um, I think the last one is what? Speaking, speaking. So there are four of them. So there is an instruction, apart from the total score, which should be 6.5 or seven, I think. There should be a minimum that you should have for each band and it's 23. She had 22 on a particular band. Oh, wow. So she did not pay attention to instruction. Yeah. She didn't pay attention to detail. Details. And that was the problem. Yeah. Now, she could have used another option. She had the option of taking a letter of English language proficiency from her school because she was yeah. taught in English. That's another option. If she had found out that, oh, look, oh, I do not have up to 23, she would have abandoned that option and gone for the other and she would not have been disqualified but when you do not follow instructions or you don't pay attention to details these kind of simple things very simple would disqualify you and it would be very sad i have to sip some water now <laughs> it's okay go ahead go ahead and i, I am actually just agreeing with so okay. many of the things <laughs> that you said because it's so rampant everything like everything you said is so rampant i see it every day so yes please go ahead thank you very much so for number six i have so there are seven of them so the last two now so for six is having a poorly written personal statement or letter of motivation 
Now, no matter how good your profile, no matter how good your record, your qualification is, if your PS or LOM, if it's poorly written, you are not going to be selected. So that's one error you make. Some of you know that you're not very good at writing. So there is no need for you to just try your luck. Ask for help. Get help from previous scholars to read up your draft before you submit. Some a lot do it for free. I my company, if we run a consulting firm, is legally recognized in Nigeria. You know, so you pay. If you yeah. can afford and you can pay, come to mine. If you can't, there are lots of people that do it for free on LinkedIn. You can even come to me, I'll recommend them. Yeah. And you you like I don't force anyone, I understand. Yeah. yeah, I I serve a market, they serve a market. There are some people that will tell you, I want to pay because I want to get the feedback in a certain time. So you pay for a service and you get it back. But you know, a freebie, you can't tell. The guy will tell you, it's when I have the time, you'll get it back. So that's the difference. Yeah. And so whatever way you want to go for, it's fine, but ensure you get the necessary help and support before you submit or else you submit something really bad, you will not be selected. And lastly, is giving up easily when rejection emails are received. Now, this is also a common mistake. Don't do that. Many of us, see, rejection email is normal. It's normal. At some point, eh? in fact, these days, we call it love letter. <laughs> it's love letter. They love you so much that they rejected you. How amazing. <laughs> so, the truth of the matter is, you guys should learn to embrace and at the end i will tell you one or two things you need to do on how to handle rejection it's one of the questions that i'll be asked so i would tell you one or two things but i need to let you know at this stage that it's normal to get rejection why these opportunities are difficult to get so if you get a rejection or two it's fine there's no problem yeah, yeah. the principle is never stop trying until you win before I got my, my MSc, I lost 23 opportunities, scholarships, 23, no joke, 23. I lost 23 and I won the very last two. I won the very last two, but I lost 23. So um, if I had given up at some point and I stopped, I would not have won anything and i'll tell you this life is hard they're not picking anybody i am just i'm frustrated blah 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 but i kept trying until yeah. i won and when i won i won yeah. too yeah what people will tell you is this guy has won the commonwealth twice they won't tell you the story behind the glory i have lost close to 50 scholarships in my lifetime so embrace rejection when they come yeah. You can you are free to suck for some days, but pick yourself up afterwards and keep going. Yeah. So yeah. that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing.